I was talking to Ruth Catlow yesterday, and they mentioned that everyone has a story about the time where they, they didn't get onto the blockchain. So they encountered the ideas, and they're like, mm, this is a bit weird, or this is a bit crazy, or mm, maybe it won't be something I need to learn about. Uh, my moment like that was back in 2011, when I actually tried to start making blockchain art. And I said on my blog, OK, if anyone gives me a Bitcoin, I will draw you a Bitcoin and mail it to you. And one person actually got in touch with me and said, so how do we go about doing this? And I freaked out. And I was like, hang on, what happens if the price of Bitcoin just collapses and I'm, I'm left with this worthless Bitcoin? So I, I didn't get back to them. And that's how I didn't get my first Bitcoin. Um, but after that initial moment of really not guessing it. Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and the blockchain didn't go away and I just kept encountering the ideas and the ideas became interesting to me and because it was after the financial crisis, because it was at the moment where Web 2.0 was being taken over by the current internet giants, the ideas of a sort of autonomous currency and network that runs without rulers, without masters, and a system that has a very, very um, 1990s style attitude towards identity being very pseudonymous and something that you, you play with and can take on and cast off as you wish, started appealing to me more and more. And I would try to explain this to people and they would look at me like I was crazy. So the way that I explained this to myself and to other people was by writing Facecoin. Now, Facecoin is a proposal for a proof-of-work system of the type that Sam spoke about earlier. The current Bitcoin proof-of-work system uses electricity to run an algorithm to basically find random numbers with very long strings of zeros at the end, which is difficult to do, so it slows down the network and you prove that you've done some work. And when people find out this is how Bitcoin is secured, they get very upset at what they regard as the waste of all this energy. It's not really wasted, it's used to secure the network, but it, it looks extravagant compared to a single light bulb or the country of Norway. <laughs> so there are various proposals to make useful proof of work systems where rather than doing random numbers with lots of zeros at the end, you are trying to sequence genomes or um, sequence genomes. So I thought rather than doing useful work or useless work, let's do the work of art. Because art is sort of in many ways defined by the fact that it is useless. You can't, you, if you use a Picasso as an ironing board, you're making a mistake. But it, it still has value. So what was the simplest thing that you can make art from? It's a drawing of a face. And what's a nice way of finding faces? It's using machine vision algorithms. So what Facecoin does is it does, uh, and it's not an actual cryptocurrency, but it's a demonstration for one. So it does the work that Bitcoin does of generating like a, a block of information and then trying to find something by modifying that information. And rather than trying to find strings of zeros, it's trying to find faces. So it starts out with um, a nicely blurred block of data. And after a while, it finds something that it thinks looks like a face. And then after a little while longer, it finds something that looks a bit more like a face in the next one. And I, I just like this. It's sort of, you, you get into it, you, you get a feel, when it's actually running, you get a feel for the rhythm of the blockchain and the work that's involved. But you're not having to understand what a SHA-256 sum or anything is, because you're looking for faces, which you can do and you're better at than the computer. But it's kind of fun to watch it searching through. Um, one of the things I love doing with crypto art is collaboration. I've been really lucky in the people I've ended up collaborating with. One of my absolute favorites was a um, coin artist on Twitter, um, is someone who creates alternate reality games with cryptocurrency themes. So um, they get a series of puzzles together. They are often paintings or drawings or other artworks that coin artist makes. And these are sort of revealed on the internet. People go through them, they search for clues, they get together. Sometimes they crack them much more quickly than you might expect. Sometimes they crack them much more slowly. The one that they cracked really, really, really slowly was this painting by Khan Artist called The Legend of Satoshi Nakamoto. 
um, I helped encode a message into the painting. When you tell people this, and they know about Bitcoin, they think, oh, you use QR codes for representing Bitcoin addresses, so there's probably a QR code in the chessboard pattern. Um, but there's not enough squares for a QR code, so I don't know why people really focused in on that. Where the message is hidden, and the message is a Bitcoin private key for a wallet, which contained almost five Bitcoins, where that is, is hidden in the flames around the edge. And the way it's hidden in the flames is, and, and to be entirely clear, someone has solved the puzzle and claimed the prize, so I'm okay to tell you this now. Um, the way it's encoded is the height of the flames, the width of the flames, and the color of the flames. So it's a, I think it's a six-bit encoding. And for whatever reason, m most puzzles use like one-bit binary encodings, but going up to six bits just really, really, really made it much harder than I think we expected. When the prize was put into the puzzle, five Bitcoin are worth about $1,200, I think, or, you know, it was, it was a lot of money, it's, but it's not a ridiculous amount of money. Um, what is a ridiculous amount of money is $60,000, which is what the prize went up to during the great Bitcoin price rise at the end of last year. And so I had people following me on Twitter who I'm sure were just there waiting for me to let slip a clue about this. Unfortunately, no one ever came up to me in person and threatened me or like tried to get me extremely drunk and pick my brains or anything. <laughs> but it was a weird insight into you know, the, the, the cypherpunk world where actually sometimes you do have secrets that you have to keep and there may be people want to get them from you and you should probably encrypt them better than you had. And as with Facecoin, I just loved the way that coin artist puzzles draw you into the ideas around cryptocurrency, around the blockchain. In this case, the way that private keys work, the way that um, security for your Bitcoin accounts work, and the way collaborating to crack a puzzle works. Once you've extracted the six-bit message from the flames, there's one more step. You need a key to re-encode them. And people just couldn't find the key. They were like, we know we need a key. We've got all these bits. We can't work out where the key is. Where could the key possibly be? That's a painting of a key sticking into a keyhole in the board with ribbons on it, and the ribbons represent the key as, as bits. And, and for some reason, the key being a key was just too obvious for people. So I was, I was very relieved, and I could finally have a sort of a moment of exasperation and go, it was a key, how much more obvious could we have made it? But it was wonderful watching people get together and collaborate around um, sort of really working through the structure of, of the puzzle and the piece of art that a uh, coin artist sort of had made with it and for me that's one of the things that um, blockchain art the cryptocurrency art can do is to engage people get them really to dive into the ideas and not to dive into the ideas in a you know let, let's understand what this technology can do to replace this particular database in a way that makes them sort of work together in new ways or to sort of work on creative tasks that they otherwise wouldn't and um, yeah, I was really proud to be involved in this. Um, a collaboration the other way around was Bad Shibe, which was a short story I wrote at the end of 2014. It was copy edited in 2016 and was then published in 2017. And it is a story set about 15 years from now in a world where cryptocurrency has won. We don't know how the narrator of the story, who is incredibly unreliable, particularly doesn't know. And we, we don't care, it, it's one, you know, we, we accept this as part of the story. And as I say, the character is a young person who's never really thought how their world works. One morning they wake up, they do the usual thing that they do, is they check the leaderboard for who's being the absolutely best shy in their area and the downward spiral starts there. Um, that's the cover. Um, Ruth wrote the afterword. It was edited by Talk, I think. Yeah, edited by Talk in England. Thank you, Talk. You did a great job getting it down from 7,000 words, in which very little happens, to 4,000 words and about the same amount happening. 
and the illustrations, including the cover here, were done by the marvellous Lena Theodoru. Um, this isn't a spoiler, but it's a scene at the end. Um, this is a picture of YS, the protagonist, going to school. It's not a cartoon animal universe, it's not a Disney universe. The problem is the narrator tells you absolutely nothing about other people because they don't want to give away their identities. So I don't really know what the lead character looks like. So Lena had a bit of a problem in illustrating a story where you're deliberately not told what anyone looks like. And they did, they did a brilliant job doing it, so that's YS talking to their teacher at school. And this is actually an, uh, an installation of the illustrations at a show at Furtherfield Gallery in London, in England. So the little glowing rectangles are tablets or phones, as I'm sure YS would regard them, showing the different illustrations. And I will now read you the start of YS's journey. Wow, it's two days since I rank checked. Are we there yet? Hello, phone. What's my rank? Wow, much slippage. There's a noob who's ahead of me in the rankings. Amaze! Bang Zoom 78 has come out of nowhere and is tipping like a true shibe. Truer. Amaze. Such tippage. We tip our fellow shibes to show our appreciation. Bang Zoom 78 must be surrounded by amaze shibes. Very amaze. Where was I? I was asleep. Wow, I'm lying on the couch. I like the couch. I like our room. The light coming through the planks over the window is either morning or evening. Wait, if it's that strong, it's evening. School soon. I was working at the orchard today. Much carrying, such labour, so hot. Maximal tiredness. Oh, that's why I was asleep. And why it's evening. I look at my phone again. Bang Zoom 78 has graduated to the regionals. Amaze. I feel a twinge of envy before I remember that we are all going to the moon. I put down my phone and lie on the couch and look at my ducks on the shelf. Many ducks. They're the old plush skeleton ducks that you find at swap meets. I tell every shibe I think that they're funny, but the truth is I feel sorry for them. I know shibes wanted them pre, but seriously, no shibe is going to want them now except me. My phone pings. Kitty, I'm late for school. As you will have noticed, it's not written in everyday English. The language is a melange of Doge speak. Um, does everyone know Doge speak? The, the slide that Sam showed earlier with the Shiba Inu dog in the basket with Comic Sans text saying wow and amaze and everything, that's, that's Doge speak. And um, it was a bizarrely successful meme in 2014 that gave rise to a bizarrely successful, initially joke cryptocurrency called Dogecoin. And the thing that I absolutely loved about Dogecoin is the culture around it. That was its secret source, that was its innovation. It had a shorter block time, sure, it had sort of the very fine-grained currency, that's all great. There were lots of currencies like that at the time. The different thing was the Dogecoin has brought memes, and they developed community, and they developed language, and they developed <coughs> principles of how you are excellent to another, they sponsored a NASCAR car, they sponsored the Jamaican bobsled team, um, and they, they stole the, the phrase um, to the moon from other cryptocurrencies, which is used to say, you yeah, know, this cryptocurrency, which is currently not worth very much, is going to go up massively in value. You should hold on to it, or hodl, as they say in crypto land. And yeah, it, it just, sort of became almost a mantra, which in the story I turn into an actual mantra, and it's not the currency that's going to the moon, it's all of us. We are all going to the moon. Um, I was amazed by the longevity of Dogecoin. No, absolutely no disrespect to the community or to the, to the currency itself, it's just that sort of memes have a very short shelf life, but you do still see in social media feeds sort of pictures of little yellow and white dogs with Comic Sans over them. So I wrote this, uh, as I say, at the end of 2014 as a deliberate exercise in almost immediate obsolescence. I expected it to look like a 1960s surfer movie in about six months. And so when Doge mo uh, memes continued and Dogecoin continued, I was really, really quite sort of worried that my exercise in anachronism would become a, an, an unintentional exercise in anachronism. So some things like you'll notice I'm saying shibe 
Um, people are starting to say Sheeb because it sounds more like Sheba Inu. There's a bit halfway through where they're talking about the Doge of Venice because the, the dog is the Doge and the ruler of Venice used to be called the Doge and Wyeth doesn't understand it and that's because at the time Doge wasn't pronounced Doge, it was pronounced Doge or Dogi or just pretty much anything other than Doge and then there was this great vowel shift about six months after I wrote the story where spontaneously everyone just started saying Doge. But um, it's, it's collected in the Artists Rethinking the Blockchain book, which um, I can't recommend highly enough if you don't already have it, and it has um, smaller reproductions of the illustrations in and the full text of the story, so do check it out. And thanks again to Lena for illustrating it. Collaboration is great. My dive into cryptocurrency led me naturally to Ethereum. Um, the Ethereum network sort of became a hot story and then had the sort of, I guess you could call it the first ICO where they sort of sold the, the token to use the network, and then successfully launched the network, upsetting everyone who said they've never launched the network. And I, I loved Ethereum because of the central idea of smart contracts, which um, Primavera sort of really switched me on to the idea of the whole code and law thing, so thank you for that. And smart contracts, the, the classic example given historically of a smart contract is a vending machine. Um, Nick Shabo, the guy who came up with the idea of smart contracts, used a vending machine that you go up to, you have some money, you enter your money into the vending machine and you get the soda or the fatty snack of your choice out of it without human intervention. This is effectively a, a sale contract that you have executed with, without human or lawyerly, lawyer-ish intervention. And so the idea is that uh, Bitcoin transactions are also a kind of simple smart contract. You have a transfer of value, which absolutely a human being initiates, but it's then automatically carried out by the system without anyone intervening or be able to stop it. And Ethereum just sort of turned this up to 11, took it much further and said, okay, rather than smart contracts for just for exchange of value, let's have smart contracts that re can represent any kind of information and do pretty much any kind of computation on them and sort of treat that as um, a, a way of building new unstoppable code, the website used to say, that you can start embody principles in, it will then run and affect those principles and maintain its data to make sure that those principles are observed. Now, this is a very old Ethereum programming language. There's much newer programming languages than this, but it's a very, very simple smart contract and the information it contains is not an amount of money, it's not geographic coordinates, it's not a reputation score, it's not a sort of database of quantities of stock in a warehouse. It's whether the contract itself is an artwork or not. And I absolutely stole this idea shamelessly from the history of art. This is a classic conceptual art move. Uh, the concept... The conceptual art of the 1960s and 70s was one of my favourite art movements. It's, it's quite austere, it's sort of the idea that um, you know, you're, you're a young artist, you're making art after Jackson Pollock has finished doing really active, really expressive painting. You probably aren't going to be able to push more things in the expressive and active way. So let's go the other way, let's sort of retreat from that physicality and start making art that consists either of ideas or of instructions or of sensations. And the classic move in that is, is the artist nominating something as art. So as, as an artist on stage, I now declare um, that speaker off camera to be art. And now it's not art. And now it is art. And now it's not, okay. So you get, you get the idea. And the way that this became authenticated by the existing art world and art market is it's very hard to sell an idea. You can't claim copyright on an idea. You have to have like some fixed physical expression of it. And the idea of um, a column of air that may be somewhere in the world is it, it's an idea. You, you can't sell that. What you can do is create a certificate or a contract which says, I, the artist who has had this idea of a column of air somewhere in the world, hereby sells you know, this certificate to 
you for $100 or whatever, and you've created a saleable proxy for something which would otherwise exist only as an idea. And we've seen this take off in blockchain art with the whole rare art scene, where you have sort of infinitely copyable digital files that Amos Corey Doctor says trying to make information less copyable is like trying to make water less wet. You can, if I give you an image and say, please don't copy this, there's very little I can do to stop you copying it. And with initially the rare Pepe site and system and now with all the various different rare art um, platforms, you can take your digital files that you have, create blockchain tokens for them, and sell those tokens. And that's a very familiar move from the history of conceptual art, where rather than it being infinitely copyable files, it's ideas or instructions, and rather than it being um, digital tokens, which can be copied, which can, sorry, not copied, obviously that's the whole point, which can be transferred on the blockchain with the full security of, you know, a large chunk of the world's computing power, making sure that nobody steals it, it was um, little contracts. So, that's where this comes from. Um, it has a nice web interface, so it's a DAP. Um, if it's art, it says it's art. If it's not art, it says it's not art. And there's a user interface, which I'm not showing here, but if you, if you go to it on my site with a, a Ethereum-enabled browser, you can go in there, pay just the fee for the computation. I don't make any, any money from this. And you can be the person who declares whether this contract is art or not. So we're taking all of the legitimizing power of the history of art and all of the power of control of the Ethereum blockchain and just democratizing it, making something that anyone can say what is art and what isn't. And so I, I really got into making smart contracts and tying the idea of what um, people are now going crazy about as governance to it, but sort of finding different ways to um, associate basically aesthetic properties with um, ways of setting them, with ways of controlling them. So we have, oops, sorry. Oh, I'm um, sorry, here's um, his art being shown in the foam space as ethereal the other year. Um, so I did things like a democratic palette. What colors should everyone use? What colors should we paint with? What colors should our clothes be? Let's not leave it to an irrational market or some top-down bureaucracy, let's make it so everyone can vote on the colors that we should use. And so this is a democratic palette. The background blobs are the colors of the palette and the user interface, which I'm showing this time, is a color chooser and you can then vote for the color that you like. What symbols should we use? What symbols should we have decorating our shoes? What symbols should we have as sort of airbrushed on walls in graffiti? Well, I don't know. I shouldn't be the person telling you this. Let's make it so that there's an Ethereum um, DAP that you can enter a lottery each day where you enter the symbol that you want and you might be the lucky winner of the person who gets to tell the world what symbol should be seen everywhere. And I, it, it's a way of sort of working through or feeling through the ways that people put all of their hopes and dreams for, as Sam said, utopian forms of organization on the blockchain. It's satirical, but it, as with Bad Shy, but there's no cruelty here. I'm not trying to mock anyone who is going to make a better world. I'm trying to give, as with Facecoin, as with Bad Shy, I'm trying to give people ways in to sort of find an angle on these ideas that work. Um, Sam identified the way that this space breeds metaphors. It's people try to understand it. I'm trying to make sort of visual um, hooks or visual cues for understanding instead. And that brings me to shelling flags, which is outside in the show here. So the blockchain is very much tied up with ideas of identity, whether it's your cryptographic key that you buy, that you send transactions with, or establishing that you are a trustworthy individual who only has one cryptographic key and should be allowed to vote on the future of the planet. And this is a very reified idea of identity. This isn't, for want of a better shorthand, an identity politics idea of identity or a state bureaucracy idea of identity. It's an idea of identity that we get through um, the cypherpunk movement. And one of the ways that people show their allegiance to an identity, be it national, be it um, a sporting team, be it a region, be it a gender or other identity, is through flags. And there are 
full-scale blockchain nation projects, which I'm sure will need a flag, and if they don't have a flag yet, here's the system for them. But the idea with using flags rather than anything um, more, more, more industrial strength for establishing allegiance to something is, again, their place in the history of art. Some of my favorite art is around, um, again, satirical flags for different organizations or projects um, by um, where, where artists have gone out and sort of asked people, so, you know, what is your ideal, um, what is your ideal iconography for something and then making the, the flag or a painting out of that and people never like it when you give them what they think they want. So, again, democratizing the ability just to make a flag design and have anyone pledge allegiance to it. This is the leaderboard. These are the most popular flags as of the moment. Um, they are not for any particular movement, nation, or creed, because they're ones that I made to demonstrate the system. Please make a flag and start bumping these out of the running. I'm really interested to see what people do with this. And um, yeah, it's, as, you, as, as I say, it's an extension of the ideas that I've been working with since I started doing this um, seriously around the start of 2014, around get, sort of getting people to take what things mean in the blockchain world and what they mean in the art historical world and what they mean in the more uh, broad uh, political world, just bring them together and learn through play and sort of have fun doing it and make art that helps other people do so. So thank you. Mm -hmm.